Hello, my name is Larry Schaub. I am an elder here at Hebron Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you're joining us for worship today. If you have seen any of my previous videos, I'm still shaggy. I have not got a haircut yet, so I'm still thinking even more I should change my name. But welcome. We're glad that you're here. We're glad you're listening to this video. We hope that it is meaningful for you. Uh, the bulletin for the service is available on the Hebron Facebook page under files. So I would encourage you to get that and follow along. Participate just like you were sitting here in the sanctuary. Stand up, sing, sing loud. Nobody can hear you. Doesn't matter how well you sing. Participate in the responses. I do have a few announcements. There is a session meeting on June, on May the 19th at 6.30 via Zoom. And we would ask that all of you would pray for wisdom for the session as we uh, start to think about how and when we reopen the church and ask for God's wisdom for the session members as we do that. We would surely love to go back to worshiping God here in this sanctuary, but we want to be safe uh, for our members. So call, pray for us. Pray for that we would have wisdom how to do that. And we're still here to help. If you need anything at all, that us, the session, the church members can do, please don't hesitate to ask. Call the church office, reach out to a session member. We are here uh, for you. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. It's based on Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us now sing our opening song of praise, God Leads Us Along.
Let's join together in our prayer of confession. Merciful Lord, we confess that with us there is an abundance of sin, but you are full of righteousness and mercy. We are spiritually poor, but you are rich and in Jesus Christ came to be merciful to the poor. Strengthen our faith and trust in you. We are empty vessels that need to be filled. Please fill us. We are weak in faith. Please strengthen us. We are cold in love. Please warm us so that our love may go out to one another and to our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we'll have a time of silent confession. Hear these words of assurance of God's forgiveness from Psalm 103, verses 13 to 17. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. The wind blows and we are gone, as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, and this is from the New Living Translation. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them.
So today we're going to look at this and talk about what does that mean to come as a little child. It's easy to interpret these verses as you're supposed to be naive. You're supposed to check your brain at the door. Don't try to understand, accept everything by faith. There is a kernel of truth in that. Because this whole God thing is a mystery to us. We always have to remember, anytime we're talking about God, reading scripture, we have to remember what God said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, this is what Paul said. Now we, see, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. We will never understand uh, everything about God on this side of heaven. It's only when we get to heaven it will all be made clear to us and we will need faith in this life on this earth. But I think there is more concrete guidance for us than that here in our meeting from Mark. So let's take a look at little children. What are the characteristics of little children? That Jesus wants us to emulate. I have several here. The first one is that when little children are fearful, they immediately run to their parents and want to be picked up and comforted. I'm sure you can all, if any of you have had children, grandchildren, you all see that, right? Get scared, look around, where's mom, where's dad, and that's where they take off to and pick them up and be comforted by them. They don't spend time analyzing they run to their parent. They don't talk to each other, they run to their parent. They don't do a Google search, they don't try to figure out what the answer is, they run to their parent because that's where their safety and shelter is. As adults, we kind of missed a boat on this. We tend to turn to God last, um, instead of turning to God first. We wait until we've exhausted all of our human answers, we await till we're at the end of the rope, hanging on by our fingernails, and now all of a sudden we remember to turn to God. You know, that's really stupid. We have access to the creator of the universe. We have access to a God who loves us more than we could ever understand, and we go to him last. We should start there. We should express our fears and ask God for comfort not for the solution. And that's what little children do. Little children run to their parents to be comforted. They don't need to get the answer. They don't need you to make it go away right away. They just want to get in your arms and be comforted. And we can do that. We can go to God and say, God, I am afraid. Please give me your comfort. Instead, we go to God with a solution and say, God, please do this to make this thing go away. We need to run to God first, ask God for his comfort, and then we can work on the solution. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong fortress. The godly run to him and are safe. The second thing that little children do when they run to you, so they run to you, you pick them up and comfort them. What's the first thing they do? They bury their face in your shoulder, right? They take that face and they cram it in your shoulder, they want you to hold them and hug on to them. And the important thing that they do is they stop looking at the problem. Little children don't look at their problem anymore. They don't get in your arms and they turn around and wag their tongue and stick it out at whatever scared them. No. They bury themselves in your shoulder. They trust the parent to make it go away. They focus on the parent, not on the problem. This is really hard for us. It is so hard for us to give it up and focus on God. We keep, we keep looking at the problem. 
We keep thinking about the problem. We keep analyzing the problem. We keep worrying about the problem. We, and we all do this. We all say, I'm going to give this to God and quit worrying about it. And two minutes later, we pick it back up and we're back to worrying about it again. And we won't have peace until we have a human solution. But when we learn how to leave it with God, we can get that peace that was promised to us in Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I have to confess that I have not experienced that peace in my life as often as I should, because my tendency is to keep worrying about it, not turn to God, give it to God, and pick it back up again. But on occasions, I have experienced that peace, and I'll give you an example of that. I founded a software company, a CC over software company, and we had, at the time, probably 30, 40 employees, something like that. And I was on a business trip out in Denver. And we were having financial problems. Uh, and we actually, I'm sorry, we didn't have that many employees yet. We only had a handful. We had five or six employees at this time. But I was on a business trip out in Denver, and I was sitting at a Denver airport. And we were running out of money. And I was really facing this prospect that I was not going to be able to make the next payroll. And I was thinking about how I was going to have to go back. And I was going to have to tell these employees, these employees that took the risk and joined us when we were just a startup, uh, good people, people that were working hard, that, so I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to pay you. That was tearing me up. And I was praying about it. And all of a sudden, I got this physical peace. It was a physical sensation. Uh, I just got peace, just like, like God had reached out and gave me a big hug, and I just quit worrying about it. It was like, I don't need to worry about that anymore. Nothing changed. I didn't get some magic phone call. Bill Gates didn't call up and offer to buy the company. I just had peace uh, for that. And, you know, a couple of days later, I went back, go back to the office, and I said, you know, I haven't balanced our checking account for a little while. Let me balance our checking account so I know exactly how bad it is. And there was a, a big deposit in there that I had missed. We had the wrong balance in our checking account. We had enough money to make the payroll. We made that payroll and all the ones after that. Uh, but nothing had changed uh, to make that happen. But I had that peace. And I can have that peace more often if I was smart enough to turn to God first. Okay? So the third thing that little children do is they trust their parents implicitly. They don't need to understand. Children do things just because their parents said, well, you need to. So when you say to a little child, hey, get in the car, we have to go somewhere. They don't stop and say, uh, do you know where you're going? Do you have the address? Can you put it into the GPS? When's the last time you checked the air pressure in these tires? Do we have enough gas? They don't ask any of those questions. They get in the car because they trust that you're taking them somewhere that's good and they need to go. Children go places they don't want to because they trust their parent. When you take your child to the doctor, the child doesn't want to go to the doctor, but once again, they don't ask you a ton of questions. They don't say, did you vet this doctor? What's this doctor's ratings? Have you looked at this doctor's reviews? How do you know this doctor is any good? They just go. And they trust you to be with them. They want you to go into the examining room with them. They want you to hold them while they're getting their shots. So it's again, the children trust us. They don't have to understand it all. They don't have to know about it. Uh, they don't have to know the reasons behind it. They just trust that you know what you're doing and you will take care of them without them having to understand it. And we lose this as adults because as Christians, we want the entire plan. We want to say, God, don't just give me the first step. Tell me the whole thing. Tell me every little step along the way so I can make sure that you have a good plan before I decide to follow it. Well, God just doesn't work that way. God wants us to trust him the same way that children trust parents. Very seldom does God give us the whole plan. God gives us the first step and expects us to take it and we'll trust him for the rest of those steps along the way. And I think that's a problem a lot of us have. 
should be as though we can't trust God for the first step and we're only comfortable if we get the entire plan. And we need to take the first step. If we want God to continue to bless us and give us his plan for our life, we need to take the first step. So why should God give us the second and third steps if we won't take the first step? This is where the faith part comes in. And the fourth thing that children do is they spontaneously express love. They give unexpected hugs. And one of my delights is when my grandchildren were little enough, they would just run up and hug you for no reason whatsoever. They'd be out playing in the yard, run over to you, give you a hug, and go back to playing. Whenever I would read books to my children and grandchildren, they weren't happy just to sit beside you. They wanted to sit in your lap. They wanted you to put your arm around them while you were reading that book to them. They wanted that physical comfort. Little children will say, I love you, out of the blue, for no reason at all. They'll hold your hand. Now, one of my fondest memories is my youngest granddaughter, Ella. And we were up in Zelenopol. I think we were going to a parade. And we were walking from where we had parked to the parade ground. It was probably five or six blocks. And she just reached up and took my hand. And that was so nice. She held my hand all the way till we got over to the parade. I think that might have been the last time that that happened because she's older now. And it's unfortunately that we lose that. Did you ever think about this? That God feels the same way. That God wants us to express our love. God likes it when we stick our hand up and, and grab a hold of God's hand. In Psalm 91.4, it says, he, this is God, he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. In Isaiah 40, 11, we read, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. Oop, I had an extra page, a blank page here. Okay, it's gone now. Jesus in Matthew 23, 37, said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hand protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. God is, there, the scripture is full of these images of God putting his arms out, spreading his wings, sheltering us underneath his wings. So often do we spontaneously express our love to God. How often do we just say, God, I love you. God, I appreciate you. God, I appreciate what you've done for me. I know most of the time when I talk to God is to ask for something. God, I need this. God, I want that. God, take care of this. Okay, by the way, let me know when you got it done. I don't spend time just in God's presence. We just, we don't do that enough. We don't spend enough time just sitting in God's presence and not asking for anything, expressing our love to God. You know, again, grandchildren are content to be held. A lot of times they don't want anything. There's no ulterior motive. They just want to be held. So how often do we prevent God from comforting us? Because we want the problem solved. We view God as the great fixer, not the parent who loves us. And we won't be happy until our problem is solved in our way and on our time schedule. So in summary, when you think about coming to God as a little child, first, run to God first for comfort. Go to God first before you go anywhere else for your problems. Two, look at God and stop looking at the problem. Let go of the problem. Give it to God and stop looking at it. Three, trust God without the need to understand. Trust God without needing the whole plan. Trust God without needing to have all the steps. Just trust God with your lack of understanding. And the last one is to spontaneously express your love to God. Spend time with God alone. Spend quiet time, not asking for anything. Stop and tell God you love him. You appreciate him. You appreciate what Jesus has done for us. If you do these things, 
I think you will end up with a peace that passes understanding. You will have peace when it makes no sense. You will have peace when the world says to you, you should be tearing your hair out and screaming, running down the hallway. And they'll look at you and say, I don't get it. Why, how can you have peace in the middle of all this? That's the witness that the world needs now. Let us now join together in our song of response. We worship and adore you. Let's join in our affirmation of faith. This comes to us from the Presbyterian Book of Common Worship. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please join me now in our prayers of the people. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to come to you in prayer. We ask, Lord, that we would never take that for granted. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to come to you as little children, Father. Help us to trust you as our parent, Lord. Help us to turn to you for comfort first. So, Father, we pray for uh, Doug Beaumont's mother, Mary Ellen, who went to the hospital this week, uh, has a breathing tube. Not sure what's causing it, but we pray for her. We pray for Doug's father. We pray for Doug and Jennifer, Lord, that you'd be with them. We pray for the session meeting we have coming up this Tuesday. We ask you to be with the members of the session, that you would give them wisdom and guidance, Lord, as we talk about now how to reopen the church, that we would do your will. Lord, we continue to pray for our new pastor. We ask that you would guide us, guide the uh, group that's working on that, that you would repair that pastor. That pastor would come in your time frame, Lord, and you would send us the right person, uh, just like you did with Nate. We thank you, Lord, for Nate, and we thank you for what he's doing here in our church. We ask you to continue to bless him. We pray for those with health issues, Lord, all those who are suffering. We ask you to be, you would pour out your healing, your mercy, your comfort. And we pray for our medical professionals, for our doctors and nurses, for those who are putting their lives on the line, Lord, we just pray for them. You would be their source of comfort and strength. You would keep them all safe, Lord. And we pray for all those who need hope in this time. Help us, Lord, to be a beacon of hope to those who need it. Help us to be light of the world, salt of the earth here. So, Lord, use us. Guide us. We want to be your people in this time and place, furthering your kingdom. Now let's close our prayer in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now sing our closing song, Jesus Loves Me. to the one who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without shame in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing. To you only God our Savior and through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.